made a new friend this week. Having lunch with that individual raised a number of questions during the course of our discussion that I thought would be good for a study. In fact, I used that material on our television program on uh, Thursday morning and then decided to scrap what I had for this week and use this material for this morning because I thought it would be helpful for us. It's the matter of, or the question, about the subject of denominationalism. I'm just going to look at four things this morning, four questions with regard to the matter of denominationalism. And the first is, and we're going to need to define it. I think I've shared the story with you about Brother Alan Hires, one of my favorite preachers, was, was talking about a, a preacher who was really preaching about the establishment of the church and that the church was established on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came on the apostles on the day of Pentecost and the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost and the plan of salvation was first preached on the day of Pentecost and people were added to the church on the day of Pentecost and, and the fellow got done preaching and a guy came up to him he said look he said I am absolutely convinced all these things that you've talked to me about said about Pentecost and the church established on Pentecost said I just got one question he said what is that he said what in the world is Pentecost and so we don't want to talk about denominationalism without having a proper understanding of what the term is and, and what it uh, what it means and so just by way of introduction we asked the first question what is denominationalism now strictly speaking strictly speaking and religiously speaking a denomination is a religious body that is larger than the local congregation but smaller than the universal church. And that, uh, generally speaking, that most denominations uh, consider themselves as being a part of the universal church but yet existing in, existing in a pattern or in a group that is, again, larger than the local church but smaller than the universal church. Now, there are a number of groups that uh, might be understood as denominations that uh, do not hold uh, that view of themselves. Uh, they may hold that uh, they are the church of the New Testament. For example, in uh, recent weeks, I've been in discussion with a, a number of uh, men uh, who are members of some sect of Greek orthodoxy. And, uh, and that they consider themselves to be the church of the New Testament and don't consider themselves to be a part of the larger uh, body of Christ. And so, uh, and so there, is some, there could be some uh, distinction in the way that, that some think. But I want us to think about the word church, first of all, as we think about the matter of denominationalism. And that is that, now we've studied this in our Sunday morning class extensively at the beginning of the book that we're in now. That the word that is rendered church is rendered a number of different ways in the New Testament. Yep. It's uh, it is uh, it is rendered as an assembly of, of a civil uh, sort uh, uh, with Paul at Ephesus, and, and that that it's uh, it's just simply a group of people who have been gathered together for a specific purpose. But I want to think about the word that's rendered as it applies specifically, religiously speaking about the church that, that we know of. And that is that the Bible only uses this word, religiously speaking, in two distinct senses. First is the church universal. Second is the church in the local setting. There is no use of the word church that exists beyond those two designations. Uh, the use for the universal church would be found, for example, in Matthew chapter 16, and beginning in verse 16, when Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or, or John the Baptist or you're one of the prophets. You know, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus, Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father is in heaven. I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, that is his, the fact that he is the Son of God, this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, in that sense, he's talking about the universal body of believers. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy uh, uh, before him, uh, blameless, uh, holy before him in love. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26. Again, the word church here used in the universal <coughs> sense of encompassing <coughs> excuse me, all believers. But then there is the second use, and that would be that we might find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth. Or in Jesus' own use of the term, in Matthew chapter 18. You know, if a man will not hear his brother, and he will not hear the witnesses, it says, <clears throat> if he will not hear them, tell it to the church. And if he will not hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen and as a tax collector. In Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18. And so the word church is used in this uh, specific sense, the local congregational sense. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, he spoke of, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now when he said in every church, everywhere in every church, what was he talking? He was talking about specific congregations of the Lord's people. Now, that is the only sense in which you'll ever find the word church used, either in the universal sense or in the local congregational sense. And in Romans, for example, in Romans 16 and verse uh, 16, it says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, the word there does appear in the plural, churches. But what is he talking about when he says churches? Is he talking about, is he talking about distinct religious bodies that, that all teach and practice different things? Or is he talking about local congregations of God's people who all teach and practice the same thing? Of course, we know that obviously would have to be the case because the same Paul that wrote that in Romans 16 said that he taught the same thing in every church. And so that's how the Bible speaks of the church. And thus any, any idea or any concept of the church that does not conform to the universal body or to the local body is an artificial division of the Lord's body. It is an unbiblical division of the Lord's body. It might even say it is an anti-biblical division of the Lord's body. You know, there were no denominational bodies in the first century. I can't remember the, the fellow's name. It's a, a guy that I, I've re I read a lot of his stuff uh, online, and a lot of it's been very, very helpful. Very helpful. But he wrote an article a couple of years ago, and I, I had to respond to it, and he didn't respond back to me. But he wrote an article, and by the way, you can search, you can do a Google search on this and find it, and it says, Why We Need Denominations. That was the name of the article, Why We Need Denominations. And so I wrote a response to that article that said, Well, we need denominations because denominations answer the prayer of Jesus for unity, Right? And we need denominations because denominations answer Paul's charge to speak the same thing and be of the same mind and the same judgment. We need denominations because Jesus established denominations in the first century to accomplish his work. We need denominations because it's through denominations that the mystery of God is made known uh, to, to principalities and powers and those in high places and those here on the earth. That's why we need denominations, right? Obviously, the sarcasm is, is pretty, pretty dripping there. And so we see that, that <coughs> what I said was obviously the very opposite of what he said. Jesus did not come to establish denominations. In fact, Jesus condemned the very idea of denominationalism. And in fact, the check the by the way, the passage I mentioned a moment ago, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. The very next verse says, Mark those who cause divisions among you. 
Note them, avoid them. Why? It says, for such serve their own belly. They serve their own belly. They serve their own desires. And so, and so even in the context of the churches, in the very next verse, Paul condemns religious division in the very next stroke of the pen. So that is a definition of denominationalism. Just, by the way, I don't think this is on your handout. Uh, but you know, one verse that is oftentimes used to defend the idea of denominationalism is John 15, uh, verses 1 through 8, where Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. And, and so Jesus is the vine and the denominations are just all branches off of the same vine. Now, there are, there are two very big problems with this application of that text. First, Jesus said, you are the branches. He was talking to individuals. I am the vine and you are the branches. But then secondly, there's the, this larger issue. Who ever heard of a vine that produced a thousand different kinds of fruit? Because every vine that I've got produces one kind of fruit. You know, all my, you know, I've got different types of scuppernong vines, but they all, each vine produces a particular type of fruit, and I knew what it would produce when I planted it. You, know, you don't get a vine that produces tomatoes over here and watermelons over here and you know speckled butter beans you know over here. And so the very idea that 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 denominationalism could be represented by the branches is denied by the fact that a branch bears the fruit of the vine. All right, and so and so we we cannot allow we cannot allow the use or the misuse of John 15 1 through 8 to, to defend the idea of denominationalism. All right, so now number two, why does denominationalism exist? If Jesus didn't come to establish it, and Jesus didn't establish it, and it didn't exist as we know it. By the way, denominationalism didn't exist for. Over 1,500 years after Christ. 1,500 years after Christ is when the denominational concept of Christianity was birthed. And it was birthed as a result of an event that took place 502 years ago last Wednesday. And that was, by the way, or last Thursday, I'm sorry, last Thursday, on October the 31st. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg, Germany Catholic Church and started what is now commonly known as the Protestant Reformation. And from there, denominationalism began to exist. Now, that's not to say that the church existed in its purest form for 1,500 years. What I'm saying is that the church existed not in the denominational sense. You know, Look, I don't know any other, any other way to say this. The Catholic Church is a picture of the apostasy foretold in the Scriptures. And I, and I don't know any other way to say it. I mean, you can read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and you can read about uh, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, uh, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. Now, I don't, think, I don't think that that text is foretelling Catholicism, but Catholicism certainly embraced those particular doctrines in the course of, of that great apostasy. In Acts 20 and verse uh, 29, that Paul said, Even from among your own selves shall men rise up, speaking perverse things. Talking about the eldership. Speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And so the apostasy of church organization from, from God's plan of local church autonomy led by scripturally qualified men identified as elders to the system of there's a bishop over the elders and a bishop over the bishops and then a cardinal over the, the archbishops and and, and pretty soon, the organization of the church began to mirror the organization of the Roman government. And eventually, as the Roman government had a Caesar as its head, and then the Senate and all the territorial governors, you ended up with the apostasy of the papacy, 
with the college of the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, etc. They, they mirrored one another. And so, again, the Catholic Church is, is, is an apostate group of people. Now, I'm not saying that Catholics are bad people. I'm saying Catholicism is, the, is an apostasy against the, the, the teaching of the, New, of the New Testament plan for the church and, and the teaching of the church. And so, uh, and so the Catholic Church existed in a formal way with, with a pope from about the year 606 uh, A.D., A.D. 606, uh, when Boniface III was declared the first universal bishop over all the church. Now, now they'll tell you that there, was, there were popes from Peter on forward, but there's no idea of that anywhere in the scriptures. And so I, the reason I'm saying that is, is the Catholic Church does claim to be the church, of uh, the one true church, and yet it can't be found in the pages of the Bible. All right. So there were departures from the faith, but the denominational system of religion did not come into existence until the middle of the 16th century with Martin Luther, with Zwingli, uh, with Calvin, uh, with uh, 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 Hewless and, and, and others uh, that, that began to branch off uh, uh, after uh, Martin Luther nailed uh, the 95 Theses to uh, the Wittenberg Catholic Church door. And so, so I want to, first of all, understand how it came into effect. But the question I ask, you said, well, get back to your question. All right. The question is, why does it exist? Well, number one, it exists because there is a lack of understanding about Bible authority. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, Johnny and I have talked about this through the years, you know, that, and, and, and have you made this statement? If you talk to people about Bible authority, you might as well be speaking Mandarin Chinese. Because most people have never sat down and spent any amount of time thinking about the subject of Bible authority. You know, and when I say Bible authority, I mean to do and teach and practice and uphold those things which are authorized by the Scriptures. You know, Jesus, uh, or, or Paul said in Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, everything that I do in my life, everything that I do and teach and practice in my spiritual life has to have its origins in, in the pages of the Bible. But even more specifically than that, they have to find their origin in the pages of the New Testament. The Old Testament is inspired literature. There is no question about that. But the Old Testament is not a source of authority for Christians today. The Old Testament... The Old Covenant, according to Hebrews chapter 8, was taken away. The first, if the first had been faultless, there would have been no need sought for the second, speaking of the covenants. But he took away the first that he might establish the second. The New Covenant, the New Testament, is our covenant. It is our body of authoritative literature. Now, there are things to be learned from the Old Testament, but we cannot turn back in the pages of our Old Testament to justify any doctrine or teaching that is done by the New Testament church. It's just like when a man writes a will. I think I told you all my folks after... Uh, you, um, after, they, Ron and I, after Ron and I bought my parents' house, well, the house was a part, originally a part of their will. And, and unbeknownst to us, my, that being me and my brother, we had encouraged them to go write a new will because the house was bought and we didn't want any confusion because there's, there's three of us, you know, my sister, and we didn't want any confusion about the will now that I've bought that house and it's no longer really a part of that will. So they wrote a new will. And there were some other changes that were made in the course of the new will. And, uh, and, and Hunt kept all of this from us. And uh, 
Some friend he is. Yeah, I see hiding back there. Nothing major, nothing big. But the point is that we didn't know that there was a new will. My brother and I didn't. In fact, my mom had forgotten that they'd written a new one. She'd forgotten it. She said, I think the will's in the lockbox at the bank. So I go down to the bank, and guess what? There's a will in it. There's a will in it. And it's different than the one that I had in my, in my safe at the house. It was newer than the one I had in my safe at the house. Now, if something were to happen to my folks, which one we, which one we gonna go by? The newest one, right? Now, does the old one have does the old one have any authority whatsoever? It, well, they signed it. It's notarized, right? But we all understand when you make a new one, what happens? The old one is nullified. The old one is nullified. Now, when Jesus came and established the new covenant of the New Testament, it nullified the old one. Now, there again, there's still some things that can be learned from the old one. But we're not going to go to the old one to establish any practice or any doctrine or any teaching. We're going to go to the new one. The first one was taken away that the second one might be established. And so there has to be an understanding of Bible authority. But then secondly, there ha or letter B, there has to be a dedication to Bible authority. For example, there could be people who understand Bible authority, but they are not dedicated to that principle. Um, I'll give you an example. In 1897, David Lipscomb wrote one of the finest articles I've ever read. And it, 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 it's almost like he wrote it last week. Um, it's called Serving God, Not Obeying Him. Serving God, Not Obeying Him. And in that article, what he talked about was, he says, there are people who will pay lip service to a dedication to Bible authority until, until that Bible authority comes in contact with something that they want to do. Now, in this case, there were two issues at hand in the late 1890s among the churches of Christ. The first was the introduction of instrumental music into the worship of the church, which is not authorized by the New Testament. Okay. You can go to the Old Testament all day long and find it, right? But you'll not find it in the New. But that was one of the issues. The second was the matter of the establishment of missionary societies that were separate and apart from the local church, that churches would send their money to the missionary society, and then the missionary society would send out the missionaries, and the missionaries would answer to the missionary society board of governors or, or whatever. And so what Lipscomb was saying is they're all dedicated to Bible authority until they decide they want the instrument. They're all dedicated to Bible authority until they decide they want somebody else to handle their, their mission work. And so there can be the understanding of Bible authority, but not the dedication. And the, and the essence and the essence of that is is this. They're not obeying God even when they're doing what God says. They're not obeying God even when they do what God says. I'll give me an example. A man, has, a man has three sons, and he leaves his sons a piece of property in his will. And in that will, the, the man specifies, he says, Now, on this piece of property, you need to build, you need to build your pole barn at location A. And you need to build, and you need to build the stables and the horse stalls at location B. And you need to drill a well to water your animals at location C. Man dies. Will is read. Property changes hands. The son say, "Man, our dad was so smart. He said that is the perfect place. That is the perfect place to build that pole barn, that hay barn, right there in location A." Man, our dad's, and they build it in location A. And then they, they go through it and they say, our dad was so smart. That is the perfect place for him to build, to build stables. That is the perfect place on this property to build stables. And they build their stables. And then they get time to, to drill, the, drill the well. And they say, yeah, you know what? 
Dad missed it on this one. I mean, this would probably be a pretty good place to drill a well, but over here is a better place to drill a well. And they drill a well instead of at, at, at place C, they drill the well at place D. Now the question is, how many times did those boys obey their daddy? How many times did their, those boys obey their daddy? I see some of you saying two. I see some of you saying zero. You're right, Ryan. The answer is zero. They didn't obey their daddy not one time. You know why? Because they only did what their dad said when they agreed with it. They only did what their dad said when they agreed with it. What would have happened if they'd have thought a better place for a pole barn? It'd have went somewhere else, wouldn't it? What would have happened if they'd have built a, a, a thought another place for a stable? They'd put it somewhere else, wouldn't it? It's not obeying God when I do what God says when I agree with God. <laughs> Those boys did not obey their father not one time. That's what I'm talking about with, a, with reference to a dedication to Bible authority. When the Bible tells me I must do or say or teach or, 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 or implement something, if the Bible says I've got to do that, I've got to do it. Whether or not I understand why God says do it, and even if I don't agree with it. Now obviously we'd all want to agree with it, right? Because God said it. But that's the dedication to Bible authority. That's what being dedicated to Bible authority is all about. It's doing what God says, <coughs> whether or not I have any say or anything to do with it. Then number three. Why does denominationalism exist? It exists because of apostasy. Apostasy. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Depart me. The word translated depart is the word for apostasy. It's the Greek word apostasy. Some shall apostatize from the faith. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God, because there are many false teachers who have gone out into the world. That's in, within 60 years of the establishment of the church. There's already many false teachers who have gone out into the world. In Acts 20 and verse, again, 28, take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. He says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock, and even from among your own selves shall men rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. But then get this next verse. But I commend you to God. Verse 32. Give me that next line. And the word of His grace. There's going to be men that's going to tell you things that can't be found in the Bible. There's going to be men that, that don't have your best interest at heart. They're going to be serving themselves. But I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. Which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. The guard against apostasy is adherence to the Word of God. Number four, why do, why do denominations exist? Or letter D, why do they exist? Because of reformation. Reformation. Again, I said last Thursday, 502 years ago, October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Germany Church. Martin Luther had no desire to get rid of the Catholic Church. None. He just wanted to fix it where he thought it was wrong. Reform it. To take something and then change it in the way that you think is right. Well, then what happened from there? Well, then Calvin took some things and he reformed. You know, for example, Calvin is the founder of the Presbyterian Church. So he reformed it with regard to church organization. And then Zwingli reformed it in matter of teaching faith only and denying the necessity of baptism. And then, and then uh, 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 Smythe and Hewless uh, began to practice immersion 
rather than sprinkling. And so then they reformed that. And so then you get, this is reformed, and then it's a reformation of the reformation of the reformation of the reformation. And then pretty soon you got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different religious groups, all because they're seeking to reform one as opposed to restore one. The, problem, the, the solution to denominationalism is not reformation. That's the cause of denominationalism. The solution is restoration. The solution is restoration. Number three, very quickly. <coughs> why do denominational bodies refuse to work with one another? In other words, why, why, do we, why, why do we not see these groups working together even from within their own denominational groups? Number one, because of fear. Because of fear. Now, this, is, this, is, this has been a problem for a long time. Everywhere. You get a big church in town that de starts developing some level of excitement. They've got a new preacher. They got a new youth minister. They got a new church building. They got a new gymnasium. You know, they got whatever it is. Okay, what happens? They start siphoning members from other parts of their denomination. So, for lack of a better term, the small country church doesn't want to have anything to do with the big church in town because they're afraid if, if they see what they've got and they see that we don't have that, they'll leave and go there. And by the way, that happens every day. And by the way, it doesn't just happen in denominationalism either. All right? So one is they're, they're fearful. They're fearful. They don't want to have anything to do, even with their own brethren, because they're afraid. But then, secondly to that is, because of figures. Figures. And by that I mean numbers. In other words, if we associate with the big church in town and they siphon off 10 or 15 of our members, well then we're going to lose our place with our association. Now look, I don't understand <coughs> Everybody, everybody listen very closely, okay? I don't understand how denominational organizations work. All right? I don't understand it. But I do know this. I know they send their money somewhere. Because I've been reading about, for example, back in February, huge, huge numbers of Methodist churches broke their allegiance to the United Methodist Church over the homosexuality issue. No, they withdrew their membership, which means they quit sending those people money. Now, the same thing's going on in Baptist churches all over America because of the embracing of some, some people that are prosperity gospel preachers, the, the embracing of, of women of, uh, in the pulpit, and large Baptist churches are now withdrawing themselves from the Southern Baptist Convention, which means what? They quit sending them money. Why are they sending them money? Why are they sending them money? Well, at some point, you expect to get something back, right? I mean, I, look, again, I don't understand how it works, but I'm, but I'm guessing if there's 50 Baptist churches in Marion County and they're sending their money to the association and to the SBC in Nashville, at some point, they expect to get something back. You know, if they want to build a fellowship building or they want to do something or, or they, you know, they want their preacher to have a retirement. No, they're putting money in. They're expecting to get something back. But the amount that you get back is based on the number of people you got. Right? I mean, they, ain't no little 15 member Baptist church going to get a million dollars from the Southern Baptist Convention to build a building, right? And so they're afraid because of figures. They're nose counters. They're nose counters. And by the way, by and large, all denominations are nose counters. You know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine here in town, a member of a denomination in town. He told me, he told me that there's a denomination in Hamilton, Alabama that's got 1,100 members. 1,100 members. I challenge anybody to find me a church building anywhere in Hamilton that'll hold 1,100 people. Find me a church building that'll hold 1,100 people. 
That's about like that woman I talked to from the Belmont Baptist Church in Memphis about 20 years ago. She's kind of mocking me because I said I preach for a church that has 75 people. She said, well, I'll go to Belmont. What's her name? Adrian what, Lynn? Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers. I'm a member of Belmont. We got 30,000 members. I said, how many did you have last Sunday? Oh, well, well now. You know, maybe 4,500, which that's a lot, but it ain't 30,000. I said, well, when I tell you I got 75, they're going to be 75 here on Sunday. See, we're not nose counters. So why would, a, why would a church that averages 200 or 250 in attendance try to pull one over on me and tell me they got 1,100 members? Because a bunch of people moved their letter from somewhere to there. So that at some point, they're expecting to get something. And they're expecting to get something based on 1,100 members and not the 225 that they're going to have on any given Sunday. You see? So some people don't work with one another because they're nose counters. And then lastly this. Some don't do it because of faith. It's a matter of faith. You know, there, are things, there are things that we can do with religious folks in our community. For example, you know, we, fought the, we fought the alcohol deal twice. Remember? And we joined with people of faith in our community to try to fight the, the legalization of the sale of alcohol in, in, in Marion County. All right? now, now, there are things that we can do. We can fight those types of things that, that are vital to our community. We can fight against abortion with our religious friends and neighbors. Why? Because that is a, that is a common cause that has nothing to do with our religious type. Right? I mean, you don't have to be religious to oppose abortion, right? You don't have to be religious to oppose alcohol sales. You, know? you can be like me and grow up in a house with alcohol. That'd be, you know, that's just, that's all, you know. Or, or you can be one yourself. All right? But, there's a limit to what we can do without giving the idea that we're all, here, here, tell me if you've heard this before, we're all going to the same place, just taking different roads. And that's one you won't find in the Bible either. You know, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a reason why, there's a reason why we don't have joint worship services with denominational bodies, because it's a matter of faith. You see, we'll work with Barn Creek every day of the week, won't we? White House, Hamilton, we got nothing to fear. We're not worried about figures. And we're all of a like precious faith. So when people are of a like precious faith, they don't, they don't worry about working with one another. Right? Now here's the last one. I'll run this very quickly. What's the solution? Number one, understand the positions of unity. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. There's one hope. Uh, one spirit even as you're called and one hope as you're called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. That, those, are, those are divinely appointed positions on which all believers must be unified. But verse 5 is to me, not that any are more important, but verse 5 is the key. There's one Lord, there's one faith, that is one system of faith, and there's one baptism. Now, that, right, that last one right there would be enough to, to divide about every religious group that there is in Marion County. All right, so the solution is to understand the positions of unity. Number two, be dedicated to answering the prayer of Jesus in John 17. That they may be one, Father, as thou art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, John 17, 17 to 23. The unity of the Spirit means that we all believe and teach and practice the same thing. Jesus said our unity is to emulate the unity that he has with his Father. Now, Jesus and his Father didn't believe or teach two different things about baptism. You know, much less ten different things. Jesus and his Father didn't believe two things about the nature of the church or about church organization or about worship. They believe the same thing. So if Jesus said that they may be one, as thou art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, 
That means that people have to be in agreement. You can't teach different things and fulfill the prayer of Jesus in John 17. You can't fulfill the charge of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. I beseech you therefore in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. By the way, did you know the opening line of that charge to speak the same thing? To be of the same mind, same judgment, to be without the vision. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the authority. The authority. And then lastly is this, understanding the necessity of restoration over reformation. Anybody go to the car show in town yesterday? See some of those old cars in town? Yeah. All right. Some of them are restored. Some of them are reformed. Lynn's got some great looking old cars. Great looking old cars. But the best I can tell, they're reformed. And they're not restored. Because I'm pretty sure Canary, Canary Yellow wasn't available on them 30s Model 4s. Or the, or, or the chrome wheels. Right? Now, anything wrong with that car? Ain't nothing wrong with that car. Or any other car that needs to be.